Darkcast Network. Come to the dark side of podcasts. We have cookies. Cookies? Me love cookies. <laughs> Is Mothman really a supernatural force predicting impending doom? Did Apollo 11 really land on the moon? Did you find out if that was a cult living just two doors down that you waved to every single day when you got your mail? If these are things that you pondered when you should be sleeping, then I would like to welcome you to Creepy Confidential. I'm your host, Noelle your resident weirdo Wisconsinite. I open case files on my favorite cryptids, cults, conspiracies, and other worldly creepy. Bringing you new cases, live broadcasts, and local lore. Some stories have been lost with time. Others are perhaps still happening today in your local communities, right under your very creepy noses. So get ready, creeps. It's Creepy Confidential. Hey, this is a true crime podcast. If you're a little skittish about colorful language, I do not have a G rating. You've been warned. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ. I'm your unicorn-loving host, CJ. Hey, guess what? I got to go crabbing. It was so much fun. We got seven male Dungeness crabs and two red crabs. The red crabs are a little saltier for some reason, but the Dungeness crabs were the bomb. It was so yummy dipped in lemon butter. Next up, I'll be getting my fishing license soon so I can try to catch some sea perch. And I just want to forewarn everyone, I'm going to be taking some time off here in the near future from podcasting. I just know I need a little break. It'll probably be in January, though. Oh, when at the end of this month... Darkcast Network will be putting out a whole week of episodes called Wicked Week. I'll have two stories in the five daily episodes starting October 27th and ending on October 31st, so be sure to look for that. I probably won't do a regular episode that week because I'll also need to put out a Patreon-exclusive episode for my patrons. Speaking of which, if you'd like to become a patron and get ad-free early release episodes, a unicorn named in your honor, and an extra episode at the end of every month, I'll leave a link in my show notes. Find me on the socials as Rainbow Crimes just about everywhere except for Facebook, where I'm beyond the Rainbow Podcast. And I think that just about wraps up housekeeping. On with this episode's cases. For so many years, the LGBTQ community and the Italian mobsters have had a love-hate relationship with one another. The first real documentation of this relationship occurred during the Stonewall era, when the Genovese mob family opened up a gay bar in New York City. That was the Stonewall Inn. While the law saw deviance in LGBTQ behavior, the Genovese family, well, They saw an opportunity to make big money because anywhere else the LGBTQ people tried to gather for drinks and dancing, it'd be shut down and raided by police. Seeing this, the Genovese mob moved in on capitalizing off the marginalized community by offering a somewhat safe place for the LGBTQ to congregate. They could dance and drink very watered-down alcoholic drinks and be overcharged for them, of course. In 1966, Fat Tony of the Genovese name purchased the Stonewall Inn, and it catered both to straight and sexually alternative people. It was a restaurant and a bar. But it sounds like it was super gross, to be honest. There was no running water, and glasses would be washed in dirty water tubs. I'm sure the plates would be, too. Ugh. The toilets often overflowed, and there was no fire exit. But with the LGBTQ desperate for a place that they could live their truths, Stonewall Inn became a very popular hangout spot. 
until, of course, the historical riot there three years after it opened in 1969. While the mob had no problems taking money from members of the LGBTQ, it was strictly taboo for any of the mobsters to actually be LGBTQ. Our story this episode takes place in New Jersey in the early 90s. The De Calvicante family is said to be known as the largest crime syndicate family in New Jersey. In fact, the television show The Sopranos, it's said to be based on the De Calvicante family. This family's crimes fell in line with loan sharking, money laundering, drug trafficking, extortion, and the usual type of mob crimes. But when their mob boss, John the Eagle Regi, got busted for racketeering, he was sent to prison, and a new mob boss needed to be named. Enter John Johnny Boy Diamato. Johnny Boy was not well-liked among the family and their hired soldiers. But Johnny Boy really didn't care. He was an underboss, and he self-appointed himself as the new mob boss of the De Calvicante family. Plus, Johnny Boy was tight with the Gambino family boss, John Gotti. The fear of Gotti was so intense, no one in the De Calvicante family even questioned Johnny Boy as he took over the role of Godfather. Johnny Boy was seen as a womanizing jerk by most people. He had a girlfriend. This girlfriend he would take to sex clubs with him. These sex clubs were partner swapping clubs, and several times she caught Johnny Boy sucking off other men. Most mobsters at this time had wives, and at least one mistress. If they were gay or bisexual, they had to be incredibly stealth about it. Johnny Boy wasn't as stealth as he thought he was. His girlfriend got to talking to other members of the De Calvacante family, and she told them about Johnny Boy's gay escapades. One man in particular she shared Johnny Boy's secret information with was one of his own soldiers, a hitman named Anthony Capo. Anthony was furious when he heard what Johnny Boy had been doing. There was no fucking way a faggot should be leading the family syndicate, but in order for anyone to take out a hit on a crime boss, they had to ask permission and confer with the New York City mob bosses first. Anthony asked permission of the New Jersey family, and they approved the hit on Johnny Boy, but no one ever approached the New York bosses about it. Anthony knew if he was to complete the kill of Johnny Boy, he would need to be very quiet about it. Not just because of the lack of permission of the big New York City boys, but because they never wanted the word to leak out about Johnny Boy having gay sexual tendencies. And to have to explain to the big New York City boys why they wanted Johnny Boy killed, it would have been absolutely humiliating to the De Calvicante family. They didn't want to be known as the family with a fairy godfather. No one would respect them. So instead, they opted to break mafia code and take care of their problem themselves. One night in early 1992, Johnny Boy was at his girlfriend's place. Anthony and another one of his mob soldiers named Victor went and they picked up Johnny Boy. Johnny Boy got into the back seat of the car and said enthusiastically, Let's go eat. At which point, Anthony turned around and shot Johnny Boy twice as they drove away from the girlfriend's home. When Johnny Boy continued to move, Anthony shot him two more times. Suddenly, Johnny Boy disappeared, and everyone except those who were in on his hit thought he went missing on his own accord, when he was in fact swimming with the fish. Eleven years later, Anthony Capo turned on his mafia family, and he admitted to killing Johnny Boy while he was testifying for the federal government against members of the De Calvicante family. Anthony escaped imprisonment for flipping and turning rat against his former employer, even though he had quite a few kills being a muscle man for the De Calvicantes. Plus, Anthony was well known as having a short temper and he wasn't afraid to beat anyone up and break bones just for the fun of it. 
After turning over four members of the mob family he worked for, Anthony and his wife and children went into the witness protection program. He ended up dying in 2012 of a heart attack. So after I found this case on a bisexual mobster, it kind of piqued my interest, and I wondered if there were any other known gay or bi-mafia members. Here's what I found. In 2002, an Italian mafia family in Italy called the Indragetta family had an openly gay member of their family killed for daring to live his truth. Filippo Gangitano was a hitman for the family. But when he had the gall to start living with his male partner, the family was outraged. Filippo's cousin, Andrea Mantello, was disgraced by his gay cousin who was living out and proud. So he called a hit on Filippo. Andrea said that he tried to convince mafia bosses to have Filippo expelled rather than killed. But his request was rejected, and as his cousin, Andrea had to be the one to arrange his murder. He invited Filippo to a farm before having him shot. His body was placed in an animal feed sack and buried, and then later it was covered in cement. In 2019, it was reported by media that this same family went soft and they were now allowing LGBTQ members to join their ranks after a mob boss's son was found to be a drag queen performing under the name Lady Godiva. Apparently, quite a few of these family members also enjoyed going to the drag shows. The family's rule is, as long as you're not publicly out and you still appear like a tough machizio gangster, you can be in their mafia. But unfortunately for this mob family, that same year, 355 members were arrested and charged in a situation that involved 2,500 Italian military police officers as well. It was the biggest bust since 1984 when a Sicilian mob family had 450 of their members get arrested and go to trial. In 2009, Robert Mormondo, a hitman for the Gambino mob, was on trial, and he turned federal informant. Not just outing other members of the family as killers and criminals, but he also outed himself as a gay man. At the time he was being questioned in court, he was being charged with the murder of a bagel shop owner in Queens in 2003. By outing himself in court, he was hoping that the judge would go more lenient on him. Since Robert was no longer involved with the mob, and now he was a federal informant, he was to get at least a 17-year sentence, but it was reduced down to just a few years. My last mob-adjacent story is indirectly about a late mob boss named William, Willie the Rat, Camisano. He was aptly named Willie the Rat for killing people and sticking him in the sewers so the rats would eat their bodies. He sounds fucking charming, doesn't he? Well, Willie, he would have been turning over in his grave if he knew that his grandson Vito was dating a black person. So Willie the Rat was racist, too. Who knew? But not just that. The black person Vito was dating was a man. College football great Michael Sam. The couple were engaged to be married for six months in 2014, but they called it quits in 2015. After calling it off, Michael Sam announced his retirement from professional football for mental health reasons. And that's really all I have for you on LGBTQ mobsters. So with that, let's get into our true crime quickie. As of June 2023, only 16 states in Washington, D.C. disallow the use of the gay panic defense. That leaves what, like 34 states that still allow it? It's ridiculous in this day and age. The state of Illinois in 2017 certainly did allow the gay panic defense in their courtrooms, and it worked. I've been over a number of cases where the killer or killers try to use the gay panic defense, but it fails. I know it happens when some dumbass uses it and it works, and I have just the case to prove it. The crime actually happened March 5, 2008, 
but the results of the trial weren't completed for another nine years in 2017. 38-year-old Terrence Michael Hauser was hanging out at a bar the night of March 4th. He met a 30-year-old man named Joseph Biederman at the bar. This Joseph Biederman is not the Dr. Joseph Biederman who died this year. I guess the one who died this year was a child psychiatrist that diagnosed far too many kids with being bipolar. This was a different Joseph Biederman. The bartender refused to serve Joseph anymore because Joseph was pretty obviously drunk. Joseph's also a known alcoholic. Terrence felt kind of bad for Joseph so he invited him back to his place for drinks. Joseph excitedly agreed to go back with Terrence to his place. After a few more drinks at Terrence's, Joseph claimed he fell asleep on Terrence's couch. He said he awoke to Terrence standing over him, wielding a sword and a dagger, and threatening to rape and kill Joseph. Joseph said he somehow got the upper hand on Terrence and stabbed Terrence in self-defense. Let me leave that right there for just a second for you to marinate on. Joseph stabbed Terrence in self-defense. Joseph stabbed Terrence 61 times. 61 times as self-defense. Or should I say, 61 times as self-defense? Dude, really? Of course, Terence died with so many wounds inflicted upon him. Joseph had a single knife wound on his arm. I don't know about you guys, but this sounds more to me like a man who was scared of his sexuality. 61 stabbings is a huge overkill. Also, we only have Joseph's account of what occurred that night, as did the jury when Joseph went to trial. Joseph obtained himself the same attorney that got R. Kelly off on child molestation charges back in the day. And guess what? The jury bought Joseph's plea of self-defense, and they acquitted him of all charges. Joseph and his attorney maintained that he was merely defending himself against unwanted advances. Wow. Did he even try to say no first? Or did he just plunge in with a dagger 61 times? I truly hate cases that the killer tries to use the gay panic defense. And in this one, the killer successfully got away with it, too. I just don't understand how anyone can get away with killing someone with such fervor that there's absolutely zero consequence. A sneak peek into a future episode has a victim who defends himself and he's put immediately into prison. But all the circumstances of that case are completely different than this one. Rest in power, Terrence. I love you, Rainbow Warriors. You matter. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay. I'm not sure a murderer, 